Welcome to the intersection of faith and the culture. This is Wall Builders Live. It's the place where we look at things from a biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective. Whatever the issue of the day is, the hot topics of the day, what does the Bible say about it? That's the greatest book of wisdom there is, and that's where you find the right answers. What does history teach us about it? What can we learn from what other societies, or even our own society, has done in the past? What works, what doesn't work? We can look at the results, and it helps guide us in our decisions today. And then, of course, what does the Constitution say about it? In our constitutional republic here in America, we obviously want to make sure we're following that document. And if we don't like it, we can amend it and change it. So we need to know that constitutional perspective. We need to know that historical perspective. And we need to know that biblical perspective. My name is Rick Green. I'm a former Texas legislator and America's Constitution coach. And normally I'm here with David Barton, America's premier historian and our founder at Wall Boulders, and also with Tim Barton, national speaker and pastor and president of Wall Builders. But today we've got a very special interview to share with you. Ben Shapiro was with us at Patriot Academy just last week. We had a great time. Uh, he had a chance to speak to the students. The students always love it when Ben joins us. And uh, we want to share that with you here on Wall Builders Live. So we're going to jump right into that interview with Ben Shapiro. And I apologize up front. My audio is not great on this interview with Ben. We had him on our Zoom, our virtual Patriot Academy. And so the audio quality is not as good as we normally try to have here on Wobblers Live. So please forgive that part of just my audio during this interview. Let's jump into it. Here's Ben Shapiro at Patriot Academy. By the way, new book is absolutely fantastic. Everybody out there, I recommend you get it. I've got one chapter left, Ben, uh, but I really encourage everybody to get it. How to Destroy America uh, in Three Easy Steps. Uh, not You're not encouraging people to uh, destroy America, obviously. You're revealing what the leftist have been doing for decades in our country. And it's a, it's a great history lesson as well. You cover things in here uh, that, frankly, we've left out of our classrooms for decades. So thanks for bringing that to life. Thanks for all you guys do at Daily Wire. Thanks for what you're doing to try to save our country. Um, I'm going to toss it over to you. And then, uh, if you don't mind, I'll start asking you questions uh, from, from some of our students and uh, some I've got myself. But you gave me hope even in the first chapter of the book. Um, even as I was talking to Michael Knowles earlier about is just the fact that none of this is new. There have been people that wanted to rip our country apart from the very beginning. And, uh, and you set that up really well in the book. And I think that's an important place to start is for us not to think, as C.S. Lewis would say, to exaggerate the novelty of our, of our circumstances. So thanks for doing that. I'll toss it over to you, Ben. Thanks for joining us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, history did not start with this particular generation, nor did problems start with this particular generation. Uh, I will say that sort of attempts to undermine American history at a time when we really should be less divided than ever. That's what's pretty incredible. You can understand why America was divided when slavery was a major part of American life. You can understand why America was divided when the civil rights movement was, was fighting the predations of Jim Crow. It's very difficult to understand why America is so divided when it is federally illegal to discriminate why there is so much hatred and rage in the streets at a time of, before the pandemic, unprecedented prosperity in American history, uh, at a time when it seemed like things were going fairly well, frankly. And yet the amount of outrage, the amount of anger, I mean, it was evident to me even before the pandemic that this was happening. I mean, I wrote this book in December, January, because it felt like the country seemed to be almost coming apart at the seams then. Obviously, that's really accelerated in a major way. And what I posit in the book, and, and it really goes to a lot of what I talk about on the show and just generally, is this conflict in visions that's been happening in the country. One, one vision says that America is unified by certain really basic primary factors. Philosophy, the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence that suggests that all men are created equal and dead by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Right? All of these concepts have long histories that go all the way back to ancient times and then develop over the course of millennia to culminate in the Declaration of Independence. The, the idea that government is created in order to protect those preexistent natural rights and that those rights pre-exist government, and that a government that invades those rights loses its reason for being. This was the basic American philosophy. That unified us because we all basically agreed that liberty was the liberty to do all of that which we were allowed to do without hurting other people. So long as uh, we were not hurting other people, the government had a role to protect our, our property, protect our life, protect our liberty. That was the common philosophy of the United States. It was not perfected from the outset in terms of to whom it would apply. And the story of American history is an attempt to rectify that imbalance and attempt to correct the flaws of the of the founding history with the with the foundational principles of the country itself and so the story of america is is about a a country getting better at its founding principles and approaching the the fulfillment of those founding principles and that is a struggle carried on not not obviously just by white americans but by frederick Douglass, who said that the fourth of july did not apply to the american slave but should apply to the american slave is carried forward by martin luther king who suggested that the declaration of independence 
provided a promissory note. And that brings us to sort of the second thing that sort of, they used to unify us, a vision of American history, that America was innately good, that we didn't live up to our promises. But the story of America is about not only the increasing attempt to live up to those promises, but also to spread liberty abroad, to spread prosperity abroad, and to free the world of tyranny for literally billions of people. And so we are unified by our philosophy, we are unified by our history, and we were also unified by our culture. There were certain things that we valued culturally. We valued church, we valued family. These were institutions that lay at the root of our liberty, that if we were not a virtuous people, we could not preserve our liberty. And the American culture was created in pre-existing America, but was certainly re-enshrined in America as a set of institutions that were going to inculcate virtue. We had to have a culture of entrepreneurship and adventure, a sense that every day we woke up and all we were guaranteed was the freedom to do what we wanted the freedom of the adventure. I mean, that's, that's why people came to the United States, leaving behind property in other countries in order to make a new world and a new life in the United States, a culture that, that valued other people's rights, that said, okay, well, we may disagree, but you still have the right to do all these various things. You still have a right to free speech, even if I disagree with you. And the, the reason I talk in, in the book about the difference between not right and left, but unionist and disintegrationist is because I think there's still some liberals who hold many of these principles. I just don't think that there are a lot of radical leftists who hold those principles. And it's important to recognize that, that there's a whole different version of, of what the country ought to be that is coming from many of these people who are on the radical left and some people who are on sort of the alt-right. And that vision of the country is one that is not unified by the Declaration. The Declaration is bad. The Declaration is a lie. All men are not created equal before the law. We have to have a law that treats people differently based on race, different based on circumstance. Uh, we don't have rights that pre-exist government. All rights come from government. We don't have a culture of entrepreneurship and adventure. That stuff is exploitative. Church and family are exploitative institutions that have to be done away with. You see this in the Black Lives Matter manifesto uh, from the organization. American history is the story of evil and predation and cruelty. That's the story of the 1619 Project. And that's the separate vision of America we're seeing kind of burst forth right now. So that, th those are the, uh, those are, that's what's in competition right now. And if, if the unionist side loses, the country will probably come apart. And, and it is quite literally that different. You even describe in your book, it's, it's, it's like the whole, you know, uh, blue and white dress versus the gold and white dress that everybody's seen. It, it just depends on your eyes and your perspective, which one it is. It's like we're looking at two totally different worlds, and it seems like we are that far apart in how we see what's happening in the streets in America right now. In fact, one of the one of the students has has asked, you know, how do you talk to a leftist? How do you how do you deal with someone that's not willing to talk rationally and logically? Going to get your answer on that when we come back. Uh, we got Ben Shapiro with us, folks. Stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Wall Builders Live. This is Tim Barton from Wall Builders with another moment from American history. American patriot Paul Revere rode to alert Americans of the impending arrival of the British, but he also sought patriot leaders Samuel Adams and John Hancock to warn them that the British were seeking their execution. Adams and Hancock were staying with the Reverend Jonas Clark in Lexington. When they asked Pastor Clark if his church was ready for the approaching British, he replied, I've trained them for this very hour. They will fight and if need be, die under the shadow of the house of God. Later that morning, 70 men from his church faced several hundred British in the first battle of the War for Independence. As Pastor Clark affirmed, the militia that morning were the same who filled the pews of the church meeting house on the Sunday morning before. The American church was regularly at the forefront of the fight for liberty. For more information on this pastor and other colonial patriots, go to wallbuilders.com. We're back on Wobblers Live. Ben Shapiro, our special guest today. You can, of course, hear Ben and read his articles at Daily Wire. We encourage you to do that. Check it out. He was our special guest at Patriot Academy and had a chance to visit with the students at Patriot Academy, which was a big hit for them, of course, and we love having Ben as a part of Patriot Academy. Ben, before uh, we went to break, you were talking about the, the, the divide, and one of the students asked specifically, how do you talk to people that are, that are so... Uh, emotional and 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 so radical that they can't talk logic and 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 reasoning with you. You always have to have the audience in mind. So this is sort of the first rule of, of debate: is know to whom you're talking. You're not trying to convince the leftist who's across from you that you're right. That would defeat the purpose of the debate. The the purpose is to convince people in the audience. So if there is no audience, then you're wasting your time. If the audience are people who are motivated to think that you're evil, and no matter what you say, then you're also wasting your time. If if there's an audience of people who are at least somewhat open minded then you can make a dent. And facts and logic do make a dent. And being calm in debate makes a dent. But you really do have to think about the purpose of the conversation before you have the conversation. A, a lot of young people, I mean, I did this myself, um, you know, probably when I was a teenager, 
uh, just get in debates for the sake of getting in debates because sometimes it's fun, but it's not necessarily effective. And uh, very often it ends up with you uh, on sort of the chopping block for cancel culture without you having achieved uh, anything that was really super worthwhile. So you really have to sort of think of the end before you begin. What would you say to, to not just young people, really everyone out there, as we've seen such a move towards following your feelings instead of the facts? I mean, how do you get people to come back to reason and thinking and say, hey, be willing to seek truth. You're not always going to be, your, your gut reaction is not always going to be right. Seems like that's part of why we're losing is people just don't think anymore. Maybe we're just not reading anymore. I don't know. But what, what would you say, especially to these young people that are with us today, to, that, are, that genuinely say, I don't want to fall into that category. And sometimes I find myself there. How do I get to the point of thinking more and not just feeling? Well, I, I, what I would say is that study topics that don't necessarily get you passionate, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, but the stuff that makes you passionate tends to create an insane level of confirmation bias because you really care deeply about something. And so you read only the stuff you agree with because it makes you feel good. It's very difficult to read stuff that you disagree with. Start with topics where you may not know much and get a more well-balanced view of, of those topics be, without feeling your emotions invoked. Uh, and then you can sort of carry it over to topics where you have more emotional investment because you already have the practice. You've strengthened the muscle of listening to, to various sides uh, of the argument. I'd start with that. Uh, the, the problem of discussing you know, a, a topic with somebody who's emotional, it just, it, it never works. Okay, it, do, it doesn't work in marriage. It doesn't work in life. It just, it just does not work. The worst thing you can ever say to somebody who's emotional is, of course, calm down. Right? <laughs> if, if ever my wife's upset and I say to her, calm down, I have immediately violated the cardinal, the cardinal rule of, right. of a successful marriage. And, and the, the only thing that you can basically do uh, is, is wait for things to, to cool down and provide a sympathetic ear. But you have to determine, again, the purpose of the conversation. Sometimes all the people want is, is a sympathetic ear and they don't actually want to have a conversation. Sometimes if they talk it out and you provide a sympathetic ear, that opens the door to a conversation. You can say, listen, I totally understand how you're feeling. I understand why you would think that. And if you want to have a conversation about that, we can have a conversation about you know, what, the, what the evidence tends to show. But you know, if, if the person, you know, insists on being in that emotional state, there's no way to, to, to shake somebody out of the emotional state. The only way that I've found, you can shake somebody out of anger. Anger you can sometimes shake people out of it because anger uh, is, is sometimes blunted with you pointing out that people are acting badly. If people are feeling sad or if they're feeling, uh, or if they're feeling wrong, uh, then it's very difficult to get them to feel not sad and not wrong. But if they're feeling angry at you, particularly if they're being a jerk to you, you can sometimes say, listen, you're being a jerk to me and that's not called for. Uh, and sometimes that shakes people out of it a little bit. As you watch the uh, jumping on the bandwagon of, of an admitted Marxist organization in Black Lives Matter and the, and the money flowing from big corporations and, and frankly, what used to be conservative corporations and, and evangelicals jumping on board. I mean, just uh, it seemed like everybody jumped on the bandwagon uh, right off the bat. How did you maintain hope in that and, and, and realize, OK, that's not the whole world. We're not alone. There are a lot of people that do see this for what it is. How did you maintain hope when this thing just seemed like a train leaving the station? So uh, I think there are a couple things to know. One is that corporations are not generally conservative. Corporations are profit seeking and they usually will answer the squeakiest wheel. So if there are a bunch of people out there who just yell at a corporation long enough, you can get a corporation to do nearly anything. Mm -hmm. That's what Media Matters does with advertisers. Uh, by the way, I know this works because I ran a counter Media Matters for the right, trying to, trying to tell the left to stop doing this. Uh, it was called Truth Revolt. And we would get like 15, 20 people call up a corporation. You could get an advertiser to pull an ad, like a million dollar ad campaign with 15 or 20 calls. That's how, that's how sensitive these corporations are to, to being you know, publicized or to getting even a, a, a slight bit of bad publicity. So I don't take their opinions as anything other than willingness to be intimidated. And very few of these places are, are willing to stand up for themselves. Now that's scary, but it doesn't speak to their actual resonance to the message, right? I, I don't think that I don't think that anybody believes that J.C. Penney's has decided that they have radically reshifted their notions on race in America. I think that everybody understands J.C. Penney's is just trying to you know, pay off the, the media so the media will stop bothering them. Uh, and, and the media have become an activist wing here, right? The media will, will go to J.C. Penney, what's your comments on Black Lives Matter? You're like, what, we're, a, we're a discount clothing store. What are you talking about? Um, right. But you know, the, the, the purpose there is to intimidate. It is not to actually be journalistic, obviously. Now, the other thing is that it's important to recognize when people are engaging in in the, the linguistic term is, is semantic overload. My, my friend Eric Weinstein has pointed this out. Semantic overload is when somebody uses a term that has more than one available meaning. And then they, it's very often connected with what, what's called the Mott and Bailey argument. Mott and Bailey argument, if you think of like a medieval fortress, usually up on top of a hill, there was the, the Mott. And then down at the bottom of the hill was a town that was called the Bailey. And the idea was that if somebody attacked the Bailey, then you would retreat up the hill into the sort of tower on top of the hill that was called the Mott. So Mott and Bailey arguments work the same way. Somebody will, will say Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter will be the, the Mott, right? That's the thing at the top of the hill. 
And the Bailey will be, America is systemically racist. And if you disagree, then you have internalized your own racism. And you will attack that argument. You'll say, well, I don't agree with that. That makes no sense. And they'll immediately say, well, what, you don't agree that Black Lives Matter? Right, which is an utterly uncontroversial opinion if stripped of all available nuance. Right. So they, they've engaged in this sort of this semantic overload where Black Lives Matter actually means three separate things. One, the movement, right, the actual organization, which is a garbage neo-Marxist organization. Two, the utterly uncontroversial proposition that Black Lives Matter just as all other lives matter, because of course Black Lives Matter, because that's crazy to think not. And three, the position that there are tons of Americans who don't believe Black Lives Matter, so we have to overtly say that in order to intimidate other Americans into saying America is systemically racist. Right? So two of those three definitions suck, but if you question either of the other two definitions, then everybody will retreat to the mot on top of the hill and say, so you don't believe Black Lives Matter, which is just a cheap gaslighting tactic. So I think most Americans were intimidated into, into going along with it. But I don't think that most Americans deep down actually believe that America is systemically racist. I just think that they've been intimidated, which means that the more people stand up and say, no, I'm not going to participate in this. I refuse to allow myself to be canceled or other people to be canceled. I think there is a backlash building. I, I wish that President Trump were a better vehicle for that backlash. Um, yeah. But I think that there is a backlash to it. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, and especially when you watch the riots over and you know, at night after night after night in Portland, Seattle, and the other other cities, that that's building the backlash. I, I think as as well. But it does it does seem like uh, even a lot of the people that just jumped on the virtue signaling are now second guessing themselves as they see more of the facts and see more of what went wrong. Okay, let me ask you this: I, I've had a, a lot of people that are, I mean, smart folks, thinking folks saying to me privately, you know, almost the same thing that Walsh said publicly in his, in his article a couple of months ago, is that, is it, it are, are these irreconcilable differences? You take a different tack in the book. I mean, you basically say, no, we faced irrecon, quote unquote, that type of thing in the past and brought ourselves together. The unionists would say, look, we can save this country and the principles are worth fighting for. So how would you respond to those people that say it's just too far gone and, there, and there's too much of a split? I don't think most Americans have thought about the issues. So I think our educational system has been just a disaster area. So I don't think most Americans have thought deeply about this stuff. They just have sort of a basket of sentiments. And the basket of sentiments generally are things like the Declaration of Independence is good, but also I think Black Lives Matter. And so you never think about like, what do those things mean? Do you actually agree with the fundamental principles of the Declaration? If you don't know what they are, then how could you? Uh, what, when you say that Black Lives Matter and you agree with them, like, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about how police brutality is bad or are we talking about how America is systemically racist and black Americans are under existential threat? Most Americans don't follow this stuff particularly closely. And so the, the notion that we are on the verge of dissolution, I think, is not correct, I, I, mainly because I think most Americans have not even taken part in the ideological battle at this point in time. Now, it is true that you can rope a country into civil war simply because small groups of motivated people are able to sort of pull the rest of the country in that direction. But I, I don't think that most Americans want that. I don't think most Americans have a taste for that. Um, and I do think that we're about to go through a, a fairly dark period in American history here where, where cities start to degrade and where people start to polarize along political lines and where, well, listen, I'll be honest with you, we're about, uh, I, I'm happy to make a lot of money off of basically starting a bunch of right-wing versions of left-wing companies and just allowing people who agree with me to get products from a place they don't feel guilty buying. And I'm, I'm happy to be Black Rifle Coffee right, which was launched in opposition to Starbucks, basically. And we can have like conservative tennis shoes in, in opposition to Nike. But I don't think it'll be good for the country. I think most Americans are not super interested in that. I think that there's sort of a temporary buy-off happening here. And when Americans get bored with it, I think it'll stop, I hope. And, and it sounds like you're, say, you're saying there's still room for the education factor that has been left out. Yeah, Americans it's, don't know anything. Americans don't know anything. I mean, yeah. by, by polling data, Americans don't know anything. And so the, the notion that everybody's already made up their mind on this issue, is that like everybody's made up their mind on Trump because you see him and you make up your mind. but no, but when it comes to American history, I just don't think most Americans have made up their mind because I don't think most Americans know five shreds of American history. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love that. And, and that's uh, that's hopefully hopefully the, if there's a wake up call, it is to learn more and, and that people are now going, wait a minute, what is happening in our streets and how do we get there? And they're willing to ask questions. I've seen people that used to ignore me on all this kind of stuff. And now they're at least willing to have a conversation and talk about it. Uh, the uninterested are, are definitely more interested. Okay, so uh, most important, in addition to, I mean, obviously, How to Destroy American Three Easy Steps would be the most important book anyone could read at this time. But in addition to that, for especially our, our young leaders here in the, in the early 20s uh, and late teens, uh, most important uh, couple of books you'd recommend to them? Hmm. Well, on economics, I always recommend um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. It's just a good primer. It's like 150, 160 pages. You can read it. It's a pretty easy read. It's an easier version of Basic Economics by, by Thomas Sowell, and it's very clearly written and understandable. Uh, so that would, that would definitely be one. Uh, in terms of American history, it depends on you know, how, how much time you have on your hands. 
And I will say that I think that my book is a good primer on, on American history. There's a full chapter that's about 25 pages long where I just race through American history and give you a very brief overview of that. There's a chapter on American philosophy that gives you a very brief overview of American philosophy in like 30 pages or less. So it is a good overview that way. If you're looking for something a little bit more in depth, then you know, the work of Gordon Wood is very good uh, on the American Revolution and the Constitution of the United States. Um, there, there's some good works of, of history by, for example, Paul Johnson, A History of the American People is, is very good. Um, the, all those would be good places to start. And if you, if you yeah. want primary sources, Federalist Papers is obviously a great source. Which, by the way, thanks for uh, doing the uh, Federalist Papers review with Knowles on the, on the book club. We're going to watch that later this weekend uh, here at Patriot Academy. But no, I, I do want to emphasize it is a great primer and, uh, on, on history of America and defense of America. And it, I just love the fact that you did this in December and January, not, not even, I mean, kind of saw it coming, but not knowing it would be this bad. America's on trial in many people's minds right now. And so you give a great defense of the philosophy of America and our history. Ben Shapiro, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll send people out to get the book. Hey, thanks so much. That was Ben Shapiro at the Patriot Academy, a chance to speak to those young leaders of the next generation. And we encourage you to follow Ben at Daily Wire, listen to his podcast and read those articles there. Daily Wire is just doing a phenomenal job at influencing the culture in a positive way. And uh, we're going to have a chance to hear from some of the other guys from Daily Wire. Jeremy Boring, our good friend, uh, Michael Knowles, Andrew Clavin. Uh, it, they're just they, they're just have a voice that is needed right now, bringing some common sense to the chaos out there. And uh, we're thankful at Patriot Academy to be teaming up with those those uh, speakers and influencers and uh, just folks that are that are that care this much about the country that they're willing to speak truth regardless of what it costs and regardless of of what others are going to say to them. And by the way, I forgot Matt Walsh. Of course, we have him on the radio program often anyway, but he also uh, shared with Patriot Academy. So we'll be bringing you that interview as well in the next couple of weeks. So be watching for those Daily Wire interviews and other special interviews we had at Patriot Academy. Last week, we shared Vody Bauckham with you. That was incredible. Uh, we've got others coming up. Ali stuck in a lot of great folks. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back for our closing segment of the day here on Wobblers Live. We sure appreciate you listening. Stay with us. You're listening to Wobblers Live. Hey, friends, this is Rick Green from Wobblers Live, and I have had so many requests about what in the world can we be studying at home right now? You know, i got the kids at home. They're normally in school. Or if you homeschool, you're looking for additional material. One Room Schoolhouse. It is a great new series Wall Builders is putting out where you literally get a tour of the Wall Builders Library as Tim Barton and Jonathan Ritchie bring history to life. There's a couple of resources on this. You can go to YouTube and search for Wall Builders and look for One Room Schoolhouse. You can go to our Facebook page and get it right there on Facebook as we do it live each Monday and sometimes additional days from there. And then you can also just go to wallbuilders.com. Scroll down to the bottom and we'll be posting the videos as they come out. This is such a great way to learn and a great way for you to share it with others. Gather the family around, watch the One Room Schoolhouse, and learn some great history. It'll be vitally important to restoring our nation and bringing back these principles that made America great in the first place. Check it out, One Room Schoolhouse at wallbuilders.com. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wall Builders Live. Earlier in the program, we had Ben Shapiro. Uh, he was sharing with the students at Patriot Academy, and I just thought it'd be a good time to tell you a little bit more about Patriot Academy and the leadership training program. That's our two uh, programs that are targeted to young people. We, we really believe in following John Jay's advice to teach the rising generation to be free. Doesn't happen by accident. Just because you're born in America doesn't mean you understand freedom. That is obvious from what we're seeing right now in the streets of America. And so we think it's very, very important to make sure that that rising generation gets this. And so at Patriot Academy, we take 16 to 25-year-olds and give them a chance to be immersed into a mock legislative session to debate the great issues of the day while hearing from great speakers like Ben Shapiro, who we heard today, and so many others. David Barton and Tim Barton both speak and train these young people. Uh, We have many others that come in and, and, and teach them, and not only teach them philosophy of government and founding fathers' philosophy, biblical worldview of government, but also teach them skills that they need to be successful in whatever arena they're going to go into. And don't get me wrong, Patriot Academy is not for, you know, just young people that are interested in government and the political realm. This is for anyone that wants to be a good citizen, that wants to make sure that they're living out the biblical command to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And in America, we are Caesar, we the people. And so we as citizens have to know our duty and we have to do our duty. We have to make sure that we're participating in the process And so that's what we train at Patriot Academy, 16 to 25-year-olds. And then 18 to 25-year-olds can be a part of the leadership training program at Wall Builders. That's available at our website, wallbuilders.com. And by the way, if you want to know more about Patriot Academy, same thing, patriotacademy.com. 
wallbuilders.com. But at wallbuilders.com, you can check out the leadership training program. And this is an amazing opportunity for those young leaders, 18 to 25 years old, to get to come in and spend two weeks with the Bartons at the Wall Builders Library, with Glenn Beck at the Glenn Beck Studios, and with others. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, in fact, we have a lot of students that do Patriot Academy and the Leadership Training Program. So check that out. It won't be happening again until next summer, but now is the time to plan both of those programs. You can learn more at the links today at wallbuilderslive.com. Those two links will be patriotacademy.com and, and then wallbuilders.com, and then search for the Leadership Training Program. Our goal is to make sure that we are actively protecting the torch of freedom, but that we're also purposely passing the torch of freedom to the next generation, making sure that, the, that we're teaching the rising generation to be free. You can be a part of that by sending students our way, or maybe you're a young person listening right now, and you want to know more about getting involved in those programs. Go to those links today. You can get involved by telling young people about it and sending them our way, or by donating. When you donate at wallbuilderslive.com, that helps make all of these programs possible. Go to wallbuilderslive.com today. When you donate, it makes it possible for us to share interviews just like we did today with Ben Shapiro. It makes it possible for us to have Patriot Academy and a leadership training program, our pastor's uh, briefings that we do in Washington, D.C., our teacher training, all the different things we're doing. You come alongside us on Lock Shields with us when you make that donation. So I encourage you to go to wallbuilderslive.com today and become a supporter of the solution. You can complain about what's happening in the streets of America all day long. But if you want to be a part of the solution, join us at Wall Builders Live. Check it out at wallbuilderslive.com today. Thanks so much for listening to Wall Builders Live. We stand undivided.